And today we're going to focus on the idea of confession. And in our Lord's Prayer, it says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The importance of confessing. And here are some definitions of confession. One, a formal statement admitting that one is guilty of a crime. When you confess. Two, an admission or acknowledgement that one has done something that one is ashamed or embarrassed about. Three, a formal admission of one's sin with repentance and desire of absolution. See, confession can be very painful to confess. Who actually enjoys admitting that they're wrong? It's hard. Pride gets in the way. That they made a mistake. It makes us, in front of other person, very vulnerable. It subjects us to one another's mercy. See, confession forces us to look in the mirror and take the responsibility for the choices we've made or the actions we've taken. Confession is hard, it's difficult, yet confession is good for the soul. And no one knows this better than King David. And as Kevin read in Psalm 32, this is David's confession. See, David wrote this psalm soon after his confrontation and rebuke from Nathan. We know, we've known that story. We've heard that story. After David's sin with Bathsheba and killing of Uriah. In the heading, you'll notice that it is identified as one of David's psalm, then referred to as a maskil. The word maskil carries the idea of a lesson or teaching. In the very beginning, David wants to teach us right up from, from the value of confession. He's wanting to teach us that. David begins by declaring how blessed he is to be forgiven. Charles Spurgeon points to the plural, plural form of blessed and describes this as an exuberant expression of joy that comes with the relief of a burden no longer carried. We don't have to carry that burden once we confess. David uses three words to describe the downfall that led to his misery, transgression, sin, and his iniquity. Let us look further into the meaning of these three words. One is transgression. Transgression is going away, a departure from God. David uses the word transgression to draw a picture of someone running away from something or someone. It's pretty much like how Jonah was running away from God. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish, the very opposite way. We've heard of that story, and it seems, seems silly to think of anyone running away from God when God is everywhere, omnipresent. But how often do we do the same? We choose to justify our actions no matter how egregious they are. And we justify it than to confess. So many times we seek to avoid God. When we transgress, we separate ourselves from God. Sin. Sin is identified as missing the mark or target. When David uses the word sin, he draws a picture of missing the mark, falling short of the target. In Romans 3, 23 and 24, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, from the time when sin entered, man has missed the mark. They've missed the mark. We were created to enjoy our relationship with God, having fellowship with Him. But when sin entered, our relationship and fellowship was severed. It was broken. And that is what sin does. It does the very opposite. Instead of 
hitting the mark, it causes us to miss it. It causes us to fall short of the target. Transgression, sin. The third is iniquity. Something that is twisted or distorted. Iniquity. The word carries the idea of taking something that is direct or pure and twisting it or distorting it. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line from point A to point B. God has given us a straight line by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. That those who believe in Him will have eternal life from point A to point B. The problem comes when we, we, when we take that straight, simple truth of God and we twist or distort it to fit our own comfort, our own plans, our desires, our own way. So simple, point A to point B, but we have so many other agendas in our lives than to get to that point B. And we get distracted. There's distortion, there's iniquity. David goes on to describe the result of holding on to the guilt of our, trans the guilt of our transgression, sin, and iniquity. As David remained silent about his wrongdoing, he felt as if his bones were wasting away. The very framework that holds the body together felt as if it was decaying away because of the guilt David was feeling because he wasn't confessing. But David doesn't conclude with the psalm in guilt and anguish. Similarly, as he used three words to make it clear, we sin in every possible way. He describes forgiveness using three different concepts to show us how God responds when we confess. David's first word is forgiven. See, when we stop running from God and confess our transgression through the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has restored us, our sin, so that we might return to God. God has done all the work. We just need to confess. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sin. We just need to confess. See, David's second word is covered. And it comes in Romans 6.23 when it says, told us the wages of sin is death. And Romans 3.23 told us all that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Paul continued in verse 24, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Only through Christ Jesus we need to confess. See, Jesus covers our wages. The price has been paid in full. When we confess, we can know that sin is now covered by the blood of Christ. And David's third concept is the phrase, not counted. That means when we confess, God no longer holds our sin against us. But God forgives us of our sin. It has been deleted for good. That God will no longer bring up the sin and the mistakes that we've made in the past. When we confess, God does not count our iniquities. To confess, the importance of confessing. Have we confessed to God this morning, yesterday, Friday, the past week. Let us not be stubborn like a horse or a mule, but to admit the truth that what we've done wrong, knowing that God already knows it. All we need to do is confess, but also to rejoice, knowing as we confess the guilt and the pain and the anguish of carrying the burden of sin is gone. But before we get into a time of a confession for five, ten minutes, I want to read you an email from Evie Conkling. 
dictated by Tim. We've heard him last week, last month. I don't know if you guys get the emails, but I want to read you excerpts of their email of what, he's, what Tim is going through. And something that even through the time when we're going to be praying, that we pray for Tim. As a ZVN, I want to thank all of you that have encouraged us by your prayers, emails, and Facebook messages. Since my suitcase project, projectile encounter of the fast-moving kind in the island off of the coast of South Taiwan on February 5th, about a month ago. Fortunately, no ribs were broken when a suitcase carried by a man in the back of a motorcycle, scooter driven by his wife, hit me in the chest as I walked on the side of the road. I only have to continue to heal now from the compression on my lungs from the blunt force trauma and the resulting asthma it caused. My blood pressure and the pulse have thankfully stabilized. One of the procedures Dr. Ari will use, which has also been done in all, in all my prior retinal reattachments, is vitrectomy. This procedure drains the fluid behind the retina, which is bulging at the place where it is inflamed. During my last six retinal reattachments, the surgeons either fill the retina with, with a gas bubble or an oil bubble to hold the retina in place from two weeks or a month or more. If Dr. Ari has to bolster the retina in either of these ways, then I will be laying on my stomach on a table with a hole for my head 24 out of the 20, no, 23 out of the 24 hours a day for at least two weeks or maybe more. The other thing that concerns me going into the surgery is that, that new regulations in Indonesia forbid, forbid private eye clinics from using general anesthesia. The last time I had retinal reattachment surgery on my right eye, it was under local anesthetic. Dr. Ari removed the oil bubble from my eye, and during the surgery, local anesthetic was not enough. I wanted to feel extreme pain. I started to feel extreme pain and just had to power through it. So Dr. Ari scheduled me for surgery on March 1st, two days ago, but today's March 3rd, as soon as he returns from a conference in Bali. This is email this past week. Tim caught a cold on the plane to Indonesia. It has gone into bronchitis. Two days ago, he had to go to the ER because of the shortness of breath and persistent coughing. Dr. Ari rescheduled Tim's surgery for March 5th, Lord willing, two days from today. The doctor, the ER doctor discharged Tim on Zithromax, which in the past, after his heart surgery and three other times, led to developing pseudomembranous colitis. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Please pray that the antibiotic will not cause the problem again and that Tim will recover to be able to do the surgery on March 5th. And this is the important part where he has to recover. He cannot be coughing while under local anesthetic because he'll interrupt with the surgery. It's important to pray, to confess, but it's also to pray for our brothers and sisters that are going through difficult times. We were blessed to hear Tim speak to us about a month ago. And we saw him speak. And he is the missionary, the pastor, who is going through this ordeal. Let's take some time to confess, but also to pray for Tim, because he really needs a lot of prayer. And we'll come back up and we'll do the communion.